Welcome to the Working Preacher Books Podcast, a series focused on igniting your curiosity as a preacher and connecting you with the living word. Join me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson, along with Bandit the Podcat. As we gain insights and hear stories straight from working preacher authors about proclaiming an authentic word in challenging times. In this episode, we talk with Steve Thomason, author of The Visual Preacher in the Working Preacher book series. Steve is a pastor. In fact, Steve and I uh, were on the same staff uh, uh, at a church together. Uh, he is a cartoonist and uh, and visual artist, and he's also the new associate professor of spiritual formation at Luther Seminary. Welcome, Steve. We are so glad that you could join us on our Working Preacher Books podcast. Well, thanks, Caroline and Rolf. I'm really glad to be here. Well, tell us a little bit about that combo, pastor, cartoonist, uh, professor, uh, preacher. How do you bring those things together? Yeah, that has been my lifelong question. <laughs> How do those things come together and why did God do this? I'm living proof that God has a sense of humor. Uh, <laughs> no, I, it, you know, for my whole life, I've had two passions that have sometimes seemed in great conflict with each other and then sometimes work really, really well together. I've been an artist as long as I can remember. You know, all children draw. I, my, my parents just uh, unearthed this little letter I wrote to them when I was seven years old. And it has, uh, it, it, it's a perfect picture of that this has been part of me because in the letter I write about how I've been memorizing the books of the Bible and I liked maps and science. And then on the back, it has this drawing of a person. It says, I like to draw. And my, and my seven-year-old drawing looks like every other seven-year-old's drawing of a person. Um, and so I think all children are artists. I just never stopped. And I never grew up. And so I've been drawing my whole life. And I've also been interested. I'm a pastor's kid. So I've always been interested. Not that that's an automatic thing for, that, for your interest. But I've always been interested in studying scripture and theology. And... Uh, my, my favorite story to talk about the fusion of these things is when I was in second grade, you know, most little boys, they they go, hey, dad, let's go play catch, you know, or something like that, or go fishing or camping. And I said, for me, I said, hey, dad, I got this great idea. What if we studied the book of Acts and took a big poster board and drew a map of the Roman Empire? And as we were studying it, we drew Paul's journeys across the map. Wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> and he said, yeah, that'd be great. So we did it. So like I have been dr literally drawing my way through the Bible since I was in first or second grade and uh, and also theological concepts like so I'm a visual thinker. So when I hear a concept or read something in order for me to understand it, I have to draw it. And that's just how my brain works. And so like. I drew my way through world history and European history and high school and college and all that. So there you go. It's always been those two things. Love it. Love it. Well, say, Steve, in the opening chapter of the book, you mentioned that you've always been about passionate about art, which you just described now, and and particularly drawing. But one of the questions I think people will have when they when they pick up this book is, how does visual preaching apply to those who don't consider themselves artists or, you know, someone like me who has not drawn her way through the Bible and, yeah. and uh, can barely, uh, you know, eke out a stick figure. So how, yeah, how, how, what does how might this apply to people who are like, oh, I don't think I can do this? Yeah, that's such a great question. And I know like I, when, when Working Preacher Books approached me and asked me to write this book, so I just put it out there. You know, I was asked to write this book. That was my first question to myself. It was like, um, I just do this. Like, how do, how do I explain this to other people? And so one of the biggest challenges for me to write this book was to to write it not as an artist mm -hmm. 
and to write it to non-artists, um, but to write it to preachers. So I had to put my preacher hat on um, because I am a working preacher and and I have the, I mean, it, it's just, I have the, the um, I don't know if the word advantage is right, but I have the ability, like if I have an image I want to use, I can just draw it. And I know that most preachers don't have that. And so, um, so yes, I want to say right now for anybody who is thinking that this book isn't for them because they're not an artist, just put that thought aside because this book is written for non-artists. It's written for preachers who want to use visuals in their preaching. And so you don't have to be able to draw. You don't have to be an artist. Um, but my, what I'm trying to get after in the book is that um, human beings are visual creatures. And I also want to say to people, you know, this is a very sight privileged kind of conversation, right? Not everybody has the physical ability to see. Um, but for those who do, we are visual creatures and um, words are only a part of human communication. And so like even something as simple as the fact that you are physically present in front of a congregation is a visual element of your sermon. And so like a simple basic thing is like how you carry yourself and what your face looks like is a visual communication, <laughs> right? Yeah. So uh, I'm going to go off script for a moment because um, we got Caroline here, a uh, great John scholar, and we got Steve here, a great preacher and visual artist. And the first chapter is entitled, We Wish to See Jesus, which comes... From John, Caroline, I don't know if you knew that. And then, he, you know, Jesus says, come and see. So talk about that, each of you, from, from your s separate vantage points. Hmm. Caroline, first, first, like, Caroline. You, so. Okay. Well, it's one of the things that I, I mean, one of the things that I loved about that opening chapter, Steve, is, is that invitation to come and see, which is from John uh, for his the first disciples who follow him. And then the Greeks come in chapter 12, verse 21 and say, sir, we wish to see Jesus. And so one of the things that I talk about in my preaching classes, and actually that verse is carved on numerous pulpits throughout the world to remind the preacher that what we do in the pulpit is not just spout off doctrinal biblical scholarship but we but people want to see Jesus that the that we imagine people saying to us preacher we wish to see Jesus and so it's it's acknowledging not how of course imagery laden the biblical texts are but our experiences of God and our experience and our encounters with Jesus have to be more than with the mind. So that's, uh, I, that was really fun to read that, Steve. I felt affirmed in my, <laughs> in my, in my preaching class, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in my preaching class, because that's, that's what it's about. Yeah. Well, I have to give credit where credit is due. So when I, when I first started working on the book, um, I did a series of interviews with different preachers and theologians and Bible scholars, and Caroline was one of them. Mm -hmm. And as as you agreed to do that interview with me, I was very honored that you would. And actually, I, I just totally, I think I gave you credit in the book, like that you, I'm quoting you <laughs> in there that, and I totally agree, I'm a, I'm a huge John fan. That's my favorite gospel of the four gospels. So glad you and, said that. Yeah, well, it, it always has been since, uh, you know, John 15 in the upper room discourse has been core to my uh, to my theology. And but then but that opening, the word became flesh and the, the fact that it's tied to creation. You know, the very first words of God in creation is let there be light. Mm -hmm. And why do we need light so we can see? Right. And 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 all throughout Scripture. And I'm going to I'm going to. Uh, the theology behind all of this is that it has been only in a short window of human history that we have been word fixated in our communication and right. in our preaching, right? Because we, 
most of human history, most human beings have not been literate creatures. They have been visual and auditory creatures, right? The spoken word, the visual, and like since, you know, since the cave paintings <laughs> to all of the ceremonial garb that different cultures have, the dancing, the masks, the paintings, uh, and then in, in Christianity, the Byzantine tesserae, the mosaics on the Byzantine walls, the, the paintings, all of that is evidence that we communicate visually the, the truths of who God is and as we, how we experience God in the world. Um, we're visual storytellers as, as human beings. Now, yes, words are a big part of it, but like I said before, it's always been the spoken word, and that's what preaching is. It's a spoken word, which is a performative act, which if you can bring visuals into that and be conscious of the visual component of that, it just enhances the communication. All right, I'm going to stay off script. Okay. Because um, so, there's a flip side. There's, uh, there's a, uh, there, there's a, that's the grace side, but there's a sin side. Because um, after they sinned, their eyes were opened. And um, the, one of the commandments, although in the way the Lutherans, uh, like Caroline and I, and now you, Steve, you didn't grow up Lutheran, uh, say the Ten Commandments. We we uh, we cut out. You shall not make a graven image. Um, which, but it is still one of the commandments. Um, it's part of the idolatry commandment. So, in the Christian tradition, uh, on the one hand, the, um, because Jesus is the image of God, uh, the art, the sort of compromise was you can you can draw an image of Jesus. But you can't draw an image of God, um, the Father, God, Yahweh. And when Michelangelo does, then I think something goes wrong, That because then God is an old white man, which is just wrong. So uh, do you, uh, first of all, when you draw, do you, uh, do you follow that old sort of compromise? Um, I've never, I mean, I've seen you draw Jesus, but I, um, just, yeah, that's my question. Yeah, I, I, I totally hear what you're saying. And it's so funny when you were saying, you know, when they, when they ate, their eyes were opened and it made me think of the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh and the pride of life, right? That's the root thing that distracts us from who God is. So, yeah, personally, when I draw, um, I never draw God, the father, if you will, God, the creator, the, the source. Um, it's funny, in, when I have these conversations with my Muslim friends, um, it's strictly, in, in hardcore Islam, it's strictly forbidden to draw any representational forms. Although I have known Muslim artists that do do figurative work. But to, to draw, like even to draw Jesus or anything is wrong for that very reason, because we can turn it into a graven, a graven image. But on the flip, and, and on the flip side, you have the whole Eastern Orthodox tradition and the iconography and, and the power of icons as windows into the divine. And so I think, I think it's important. This is one of the reasons that I have become Lutheran, right? Is the both and is that um, the, I, I totally agree with you that it, as soon as you, as soon as you draw an image of, of God and say, this is what God is, then you've you've suddenly you're you're instantly wrong because God is infinite and you cannot draw the infinite. But I would also argue <laughs> that that's true with systematic theology. As soon as you construct a word picture of God and call it a systematic theology, you have created an idol um, because it is automatically wrong. Because as soon as you say, "Oh, this is how it is," you've missed it. And so all of our constructs, as long as we hold them as constructs that help us to see ultimate reality, but not call the thing ultimate reality, then I think we can um, bypass the idolatry. But it's always a danger. Absolutely. All right. All right I got us way too, uh, let's, uh, way too 
Um, but uh, so let me tell the reader the there is hardly any theology in this book. Okay. <laughs> no, let's get back to the concrete. Um, so uh, if a congregation doesn't have technology in their worship space, or um, or a preacher just doesn't want to use like PowerPoint or those kind of things. Uh, you say in the second chapter, it's still possible to be a visual preacher. Um, elaborate on that, please. Yeah, for sure. And, and you know, there, there's so many, especially in the mainline traditions, there's so many beautiful sanctuaries that were constructed and imagined before uh, projection technology. And so there's like not even screens available. And so, but, but I will say that as soon as you enter one of those beautiful sanctuaries, you've entered into a visual space, right? With like stained glass windows, tapestries, um, even, even the changing of the liturgical um, vestments of the altar and everything is a visual element. It's so like liturgy is a visual uh, preaching. Uh, the the colors change through this. I mean, just the, just even that the colors change with the seasons. That is a visual cue that something is different. You walk into the sanctuary and everything's white. It's like, oh, this must be a special day because we've all agreed in our particular culture that white means a holy day, right? And so, and then other things. I talk about this in the book where, um, like, put on your children's sermon hat when you're preaching to adults because. Adults actually like children's sermons better than our adult sermons most of the time. They just they're afraid to tell you. And because what do we do with children's sermons? We use objects. Um, we'll bring in a toy or we'll bring in uh, um, something from our garage. And you just set that up on the pulpit or you set it, you put something right in the middle of the platform or the chancel. And that's a visual element that draws attention that you can talk to. And so, and even the simple thing like where you stand, you know, you don't have, I don't think there's a law or a rule anywhere that says you have to stand behind the pulpit to preach. Now, some might say there is a rule, but I'm a new guy. But, but if you just simply relocate yourself in the room, it could communicate something different about what you're saying. Could people see you in a different space? So there's all kinds of things you can do. And even like putting a, a painting on an easel or using a flip chart and drawing on it, you can do all of those visual things. So visual communication is not equal to digital communication. I think that's key, Steve, and so important for our listeners to recognize because I think there is a tendency to imagine that visual equals technology. Yeah. And so one of the things that you you just talked about, and of course talk about that in the book, is this three-dimensional space. Like how are you using this space and how are you using what's around you and and creating a, a creating a visual space, which I really I really like, uh, and I think is so, um, it, it, and people can do that. You know, that's something that they can do. Mm -hmm. Another thing you talk about in the book that might be, I think, really intriguing to people, to preachers, and uh, and and they could really get into it is the concept of storyboarding mm. uh, and that connection with Walt Disney. That's how Walt Disney put out you know, the animated films and you had these storyboards. Uh, and I thought that was a, a, also a really interesting com uh, concept that I wanted our listeners to just have a taste of. So you could say just maybe a little bit more about that uh, that practice for our sermon writing. Yeah, sure. And just there, there's a, the whole first half of the book is about thinking visually. Like if you remember back in middle school or high school and we were taught first how to do research, we were taught go, go to the library and every new little piece of information you learn, put it on a three by five card. Oh, yeah. And then, you know, label the top of the three by five card with the topic, write your thing, draw a picture, whatever. And and. After, at the end of your research session, you've got this stack of three by five cards. Well, what's the next thing you do is you lay them out. And the purpose of the three by five card form of research was to be able to visually organize your thoughts. All right. I'm, I'm using my hands on a podcast, right? So this is I'm such a visual that I have to use my hands. I don't even have Italian in me, but I'm always using my hands. And so um, 
So you lay the story, you lay the three by five cards out so that you can say, oh, well, this is a flow. If I, if I string these concepts together in this way, it'll work. But what if I move this one up here and move this one down here? Um, that will be a different uh, structure. And so that's all I'm really talking about. Um, when, when you're writing your sermon, perhaps don't just sit down with a Word document and start writing, but maybe take a stack of post-it notes and just write out concepts like, you know, here's a great illustration. And I know a lot of preachers like have their, their collection of stories and illustrations and, uh, and different things, but just put each different chunk of your sermon on a card that you can pin to a wall or to a post-it note, and then you can organize your sermon visually. That's what I'm talking about for storyboarding. Mm. Yeah, that's great. Super helpful, I think. Um, on page 60, you write, a wise preacher told me once that a good sermon should always land where it took off. Um, you know, take, take off from there. Ah, <laughs> well, I have to reveal the, you know, we all come from somewhere and we are formed by something. And so I was not trained. I was trained in the, uh, I went to a Baptist seminary and my first 12 years of ministry was in an evangelical megachurch. And so I was formed around that kind of preaching. And so I know like in that style of preaching, the point of the sermon is to give people something to take home. And I remember one phrase was like, you can hit five nails one time, or you can hit one nail five times, right? You can, it, what, what do you want to drive home for your, for your congregation? And so the, the idea of like, you start with a, a fun illustration or something that draws people's attention uh, that has something to do, you know, whatever the illustration is, you start with it and it draws people in and like, oh, that's kind of fun. And then you do your sermon. But then if you come back to that opening illustration and, and bring the point home from that illustration, it kind of it does a really nice bookend for the sermon to uh, wrap it up in a bow instead of like five disconnected illustrations and people are like what what did he say what she say um that that's what i meant by that it's just kind of a a method to cohesively bring an idea together i've seen um when you preach i remember uh you you use visuals with your body uh in a way that i didn't ever think to do before i met you things like I remember you did this one uh, sermon. See, here's the thing is I don't remember what it was about because it's been probably five years, but <laughs> it's okay. Might have been in six years that you did this. And um, you, you're talking about, you know, something that Jesus said was mind blowing. And then you, you know, you did the, the thing, yeah. right? But yeah. then you kept doing it. And yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, people who were listening to us, uh, uh, you, you know what that looks like. Um, and then you had me the next week. I, I took a, a light goes on you at, Right, the, the little, and uh, I tried it, and see, you know, there's. A, how else have you kind of like embodied? And then, Carolyn, this is again, this is I was thinking about, like you've got a book called Embody, and so the embodied word. I kind of want to. So, Steve, first of all, how do you use your body? And then, Caroline, why don't you riff from there? Yeah, so uh, I'm kind of a theater guy too, and so, you know, the. I think preaching should be interesting. And, wow. Shocker. <laughs> ideally. And, yeah, ideally. And the least interesting way to publicly communicate is to stand rigid and speak in monotone. Like people are going to, and especially in our culture. Now, I know you're not supposed to kowtow to the culture and everything, but we live in a hyper-mediated world where people, every moment of their life, they see movement and color and visuals and sound and you as a preacher if you aren't at least moving some in some way you you're gonna just get lost i it does i shouldn't say it that way 
this is how you can tell just by the way I'm speaking right now. When I communicate, I move my body. I don't even think about it. Like, I didn't intentionally say before that sermon that you're mentioning, by the way, it was the woman at the well was okay. that sermon. <laughs> All right. And it was the dis what I, the point I was making was when the disciples saw Jesus out there at noon speaking one on one with a Samaritan woman, it blew their mind like he broke all the cultural rules for a rabbi. And I didn't sit down writing that sermon saying, you know what, if I do the mind blowing explosion five times in this sermon, it'll really connect it. That's just how I talk. And so like if somebody does something that blows your mind, if like if we were sitting at a caribou, I would go like that because that's just who I am. So what something I would say to preachers, just be who you are. Mm -hmm. Right. Don't try to don't try to be something that you're not. I do what I am. Well, and that's that's what. I am going for when I talk about the embodied word, right? To embody the word is to is to incarnate it with who you are and how mm -hmm. you are and and your and your full presence and your full being. And I really think that's important if we're taking the incarnation seriously. So uh, I think that that's uh, those are some great connections. So I'm going to shift the conversation a little bit here. And because one of the things that we like to do with our guests, Steve, is ask some general questions about sources of inspiration for preaching. And one of the one of the questions that we always ask is, how do you get unstuck when you're preaching a text that's not speaking to you? And I automatically, uh, and I, I ask that question thinking like, well, what your book can do is actually get a lot of people unstuck, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, and, and how do they picture the text? Or mm -hmm. maybe they maybe they actually act it out or something like mm -hmm. that could get them unstuck. But how do you get unstuck? <laughs> yeah, uh, it's a great question. So um, you might be surprised, but I do a visual exercise. <laughs> but um, so what I do is I am a very digital person. Okay, so... In 2002, I switched my art studio to completely digital. So everything that I draw, everything I do is on a computer. Um, not everything, but most of it. So what I'll, I use uh, Bible software. And so uh, sometimes what I'll do is I'll just copy the text and then I'll paste it into a, a Word document or something. But then I'll actually snap an image, uh, screen capture the image and bring it into a drawing software that, called procreate but you could do this on paper just print it out on paper and take out your colored pencils or whatever and i and again i come from that evangelical background which i'm very glad that i did and i do and one of the things that i learned early on is um bible study methods of marking up your bible underlining uh drawing, color coding, noticing things that are repeated. And so like, I'll, I'll just do that to the text. I'll just go in and draw through the text. And, and as I, as I notice phrases that are repeated, I'll use a color to color code those things. And, and I go in a deep dive into an exegetical study of the text using these visual methods. And then when I step back from the text, I can start seeing patterns emerging. And that kind of breaks, that, that helps me break from the text to kind of see it in chunks. Um, the other thing I'll do is read it in multiple translations. Um, you know, I always try to go back to the original. I'm not a Greek scholar, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but I know enough to be dangerous. And I can go in and, you know, I have to use an interlinear when I do my Greek study. But, it, but, but just looking at the Greek text you can see, oh, that is so radically different than my English translation that it makes me see it differently um, just to break from it. But definitely reading multiple English translations um, mm -hmm. can help you see with fresh eyes. I think that's really helpful. When I was first getting started at Hebrew and my Hebrew really was not very good at all, um, Diane Jacobson uh, would, would have us copy it and then, you know, using different colored pencils, you know, you start to connect 
oh, I didn't realize these two words are the same Hebrew root, but they're translating it differently. And I can't draw a straight line with a ruler, but I can still kind of do the, that thing. So you're right. That's really helpful. Um, you, uh, because you come from a different background than Caroline and I, um, what, I, uh, what are a couple of the best books on preaching from, you know, sort of your Wheaton, uh, Bethel Seminary, uh, evangelical world that uh, somebody in our tradition might not know anything about? Yeah. Or even just book, books on spirituality, anything. Yeah. Well, the, the, the preaching books that I remember most, um, there's a book called The Homiletical Plot. Mm. Eugene and, Lowry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that one really opened my eyes to the narrative uh, preaching. Yeah, the, uh, and the, uh, the spiral. Yeah, woo! Yeah, it was really loud. Me loop. <laughs> yeah, the loud. Oh yeah, I haven't heard it called that. But yeah. Um, yeah. when I read that book and was introduced to um, narrative style preaching, it really fit with who I am and the storytelling aspect of it. So uh, I, I really like that one. And and quite honestly, um, I, Haddon Robinson what is you know a big name in the in the evangelical world as far as like a preaching guru and yeah. and his biblical preaching um those are the only two type uh authors i can think of right now um i remember my preaching class really well i don't remember the texts i read mm -hmm. yeah. yeah and then as far as like um just where i get inspiration so this is also evidence of my background but um dallas willard has been and continues to be uh, hugely influential in my spirituality, in my understanding of of who God is and how we uh, interact with the kingdom of God. And um, I've just been, in preparation for this class I'm teaching, I've been diving back into uh, Willardian theology. <laughs> but uh, Dallas Willard, and in, in you know, all of his books are great two really key ones one is called the uh the great omission and it's a it's a really thick book on um the sermon on the mount and how we have classically in western christianity and particularly in the evangelical tradition have completely lost what is the kingdom of god that it is present and yet to come and um we've kind of he breaks down that dualism of it's you know just something you're looking forward to after you die but then the book that really influenced me was uh renovation of the heart um i go back to that one often well, thanks for that steve and uh as you know one of our co-hosts who has yet to make a sighting today but we there's still time is bandit the podcast Ooh. and bandit today has some questions for you oh boy uh, and Bandit in particular wants to know how much you like to draw cats. Oh, well, I just like to draw everything. And <laughs> I, I will admit, I have been forced to be a cat person. I'm not a cat person, but my children who are all adults and have lived with me at different periods, I, I have lived with two cats in my house. And they are fun to draw because they're so... Um, their bodies move so they're like fluid they're they're really cool to watch and I, especially i get mesmerized by that that tail that just it's like it's floating in water <laughs> uh bandit also would like to know which biblical character would be most likely to own a cat as a pet well i was i was thinking about this and because i'm really not a cat person i think herod the great as he sits there stroking a cat, <laughs> maniacally planning to, to crush all of the little people. <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> stroking his Siamese cat. <laughs> yeah, or a big fluffy white thing. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. One more, one more bandit question. Bandit wants to know what is one game you could play endlessly and never get bored? Uh, fidget spinner. Ah. Right. Yeah, that you just sit there and watch it spin <laughs> over and over and over. Yeah. Actually, 
I would get bored with most games, but yeah. <laughs> Steve, you also have a website. Is it the Visual Preacher? Uh, Visualpreacher.com. So you, yeah, they can find your um, uh, lots of resources on this, including your um, books on the Gospels, sort of. Uh, yeah, a Visual Preacher is just kind of a landing page for the book itself. Cartoonist Bible. Dot That's com. what I was thinking of. Cartoonist Cartoonistbible.com Bible. Bible. is where you're going to find literally draw. I've literally drawn through the entire Bible. Hmm. Uh, some are some books have almost nothing. Some books are a deep, deep hundreds and hundreds of illustrations. That's great. Well, Steve, this has been so great to have you on the podcast and this conversation. So thanks so much for being with us today. And thanks for listening to this episode of the Working Preacher Books podcast. Stay up to date on our conversations at workingpreacher.org. You can follow us on Twitter or Facebook and find the latest in our Working Preacher book series at workingpreacher.org slash books. Thanks for joining us.